Well, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome you to our July edition of Lab to Table Conversations. We're going to focus on melanoma today. We've got a great group of panelists that will be uh, participating in this discussion. I, uh, I'm Ann Richmond. I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmacology, and I've been doing basic and translational melanoma research for over 40 years now. And we're just delighted to share with you some, some ideas that we have about past and, and current and future treatments for melanoma. Uh, this is all sponsored by the School of Medicine, Basic Sciences. And uh, I'd like to mention that if you have questions going along, then uh, there's a question and answer or a Q&A uh, at the bottom of your screen, and you can pop in your questions there. So if I can have the first slide, Erin. So uh, what is melanoma? Uh, melanoma is the most deadly form of skin cancer. Uh, we, we know that it arises, uh, if it's cutaneous melanoma, it arise on the skin, uh, but it can also arise in mucosal surfaces of the skin and in acro surfaces like the bottom of the foot or the palms of the hand. We get around 100,000 new cases of melanoma that are diagnosed annually. And uh, if these lesions are removed early on, there's a very good prognosis. However, for metastatic melanoma, uh, there's a very poor uh, survival. And until recently, that survival prediction was only about 20%. But recent advances have changed that. And that's what we're really happy to share with you today in our discussions. Next slide. So in contrast to cutaneous melanoma, we have uveal melanoma. It's the second most common type of melanoma, but it's a lot rarer. Uh, and you can see this little red line around here. These are the areas of the eye uh, that uh, can be uh, the origin and provide the origin for ocular melanoma. It's in the uveal tract in the back of the eye. And this uh, very frequently arises from the choroidal nevus. Uh, a nevus is a mole in the back of the eye. You see this here uh, with regard to what it looks like uh, to your ophthalmologist. And these rapidly spread to become malignant melanoma. While there are only about five cases per million people, uh, this particular lesion is not as associated with sun exposure. Next slide. And uh, it's usually diagnosed by clinical exam and imaging, not by biopsy. So again, the op ophthalmologist looking in. We treat this usually with radiation, surgically implanted into the back of the eye, uh, not surgical removal of the eye. Next slide. And this, uh, unlike cutaneous melanoma, which usually spreads through the lymphatics and local lymph nodes, ocular melanoma goes by the bloodstream most frequently to the liver. Next. The prediction uh, for metastatic risk is pretty accurate. It's based on some specific mutations. And you can see the survival here of uh, those uh, metastatic lesions uh, tends to be very poor. And we don't use immunotherapy to treat ocular melanoma. It's not very effective. And then finally, these mutations uh, that are associated with ocular melanoma are usually GN and GQ, GNAQ and uh, also a BAP mutation. So next slide. Uh, actually, uh, melanoma ther therapy has been pretty dismal up until a recent breakthrough that was due to the hard work of Jim Allison and Tezuko Hanjo. Jim discovered a protein that's expressed on T cells called CTLA-4, and Tezuko discovered another protein called PD-1. These we call checkpoint inhibitors, and they block the activation of T cells so that they can't do their work to destroy tumor cells. Antibodies were developed to these two proteins, and they became the major breakthrough for therapy for melanoma. Next slide. And uh, this didn't happen overnight, though. Uh, though the, the public only really knew about this around 2011, it all really started back around 1891, where uh, Coley discovered that he could actually inject a bacterial toxin into cutaneous melanoma lesions, and some of them would go away. 
And uh, this led us to really understand the role of the immune system. This, this bacterial toxin activated the immune system. And we learned about immunosurveillance, that our immune system is supposed to be looking for changes in cells that might make them malignant and kill them. So around 60s, we were still using adjuvants like toxins for tumors. And then over time, we moved to use specific cytokine therapies like interferon alpha and IL-2 to boost the immune cells so that they would do a better job of killing tumor cells. And then finally, in 2011, epilumumab, which is the antibody to CTLA-4, was approved for metastatic melanoma treatment. And shortly after that, another antibody to PD-1 called nivolumab uh, was in fact approved for uh, therapy for metastatic melanoma. Next slide. Now, uh, while all of this was going on, a lot of basic scientists were really busy understanding the genetics of melanoma. And we learned that ab about 45% of melanomas have a mutation in a gene called BRAF. And we developed inhibitors of this particular uh, activity associated with BRAF. Those were called vimurafamid and dubrafenib. Other lesions have NRAS mutation, and we developed inhibitors to this pathway uh, called trametinib and cobametinib. Now, next slide. So the therapeutic advances in melanoma, you can see on this timeline, back around 1975, the only thing we really had to offer was the carbazine. And it had a very uh, dismal uh, response rate, only around 13%. Survival was very poor with decarbazine, and frequently melanoma patients died very, very early on in the course of their disease. And then I've described a high dose IL 2, and then uh, treatment with dubrafenib and trametinib. Now, these inhibitors that were targeting BRAF and MAC, you can see this, this patient here that has melanoma lesions all over his body. And after a few weeks treatment with trametinib and uh, vimurafamid, the lesions were all gone. Everybody was so excited about this treatment. But within six months, the lesions started coming back and resistance developed uh, in these lesions to the treatment. So with that, about the same time, the emergence of immune therapy uh, with nivolumab, epilumumab, or primboluzumab, uh, then this became the treatment that we wanted to use for our first line treatment for metastatic melanoma. Next slide. And next slide, next slide, if you can hit a couple of times. So now we have a whole host of types of treatment that are available and our doctors on the panel today are going to talk about these and the possibilities going forward. Next slide. So uh, just to sum it up, uh, I can, I'm showing you two slides here. This is called a progression-free survival slide. And you can see that patients that were treated with this therapy called dacarbazine, you can see that most of them uh, died early on. And then uh, they began to you know, level off with about 15 to 20% at best surviving. And treatment with epilumumab in combination with that, that's a CTLA-4 antibody, didn't help a whole lot. But down here, if you go to the treatment with nivolumab, you can see that 44% of the patients are now surviving out to 69 months, which is fantastic. And combining that with epilumumab, 52% of the patients are surviving. So this is how basic science and clinical research have advanced the field and made it a whole lot better for at least 50% of our melanoma patients with metastatic melanoma. So that's, that's all I have to tell you about the introduction before we start our discussions. But first, I want to introduce you to Kimberly Jessup. Kimberly is a survivor of stage four metastatic melanoma. She has two children and a wonderful husband. And she has uh, really a phenomenal story to share with you today. She and her husband have worked very diligently in the Memphis area to raise money for funding melanoma research. They sponsor a 5K run and a number of other activities uh, in the Memphis area. 
And so it's my my joy to introduce to you today, Kimberly. And uh, so Kimberly, if you'll take it away. Sure, thank you uh, so much for having me. I, every time I see all of those statistics and that timeline, and then I see where my life falls right in the middle of that, it's just, it's overwhelming um, that, uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Vanderbilt. I mean, my goodness. Um, my story started in 2010. Um, I was diagnosed with stage four metastatic melanoma. I was 33 and my uh, children were two and five and you saw them, they're big now. They were, they were babies. And um, my husband and I really, we were devastated. I mean, you can only imagine um, what we felt at that time. And, you know, going through that timeline and seeing how, you know, the research kind of came about, we, you know, now know that I was diagnosed, honestly, at just such a remarkable time when melanoma um, drugs were starting to be, you know, take off. Um, so the first, I actually got three opinions. Vanderbilt was my third one. Um, the first opinion I got I came, was locally, I live here in Memphis, and um, the doctor told me, he said, I could treat you, it wouldn't be the best, you need to go home and pray and look for a clinical trial, and so that's what we did, and then it wasn't that easy, we searched through the internet, we went a couple of places, I ended up at Vanderbilt, um, I believe my first time was in January of 2011, uh, where, where I met Dr. Johnson and, and uh, Dr. Sossman that, that was there previously. And um, we started to go down through the list of treatments. Nothing looked good. Nothing looked like this. You know, I was hoping for something that, that was going to be a winner. I'd never got that. Um, but I got, you know, a little piece of hope here and there. And, you know, I will call myself probably one of the most stubborn people on the planet. So I went with it. And um I started on uh, high dose IL-2 in January of 2011 and did, I don't remember how many doses you could get, but I got all of them because I was bound and determined whatever it takes, I'm going to do that. Um, I found out that it, it, I guess it partially worked, um, but I still had uh, tumors that continued to develop and some did shrink. Um, I think at the beginning I had about 17 is what we can remember. And um, then because I failed that, uh, we I qualified for a clinical trial that is um, now, it was MDX 1106, uh, nivolumab is, I guess, what you, in, you know, Optivo or whatever you want to call it. I started on that in May, I, I believe it was May of 2011, and a phase one trial, I did that for about, I guess, eight or nine months. And in the fall, I was doing really well. Um, and in the fall of 2011, I started to get um, some back pain. We weren't sure if it was related to the drug, but the short of that is it was uh, because of a spinal tumor that had progressed to my spine. And I became more and more weak, more weak and uh, you know, where I was unable to really walk or that well. Um, and I ended up in basically emergency surgery to uh, remove that tumor from the compression of my spinal cord. Well, as you know, when it goes to your spine and it's not good. And so we, um, so uh, my husband, you know, heard like we removed the tumor and he gave her some time and he was thrilled with that because time is all we wanted. Um, so that I then went back on the drug on the trial after I recovered from that a little bit. You know, I, like I said, I don't, I live in under some fallacious reasoning too. So I felt like I was doing pretty good if I was upright and I, I'm a pediatric physical therapist. Um, so I've, I could knew how to, I knew how to get back going. And, um, so then that was working out pretty well until my white count went kind of crazy and nobody was really sure what happened there, but I had to stop the drug. And um, it turned out that I had developed um, CML or chronic myeloid leukemia um, in the midst of all of that. So I like to say I got kicked off 
<laughs> but and I really did get kicked off the drug. But the remarkable thing about immunotherapy is that in spite of everything, it continued to work and do its job. Um, I started on to Cigna, which is a targeted drug for CML in the spring of 2012, around May and June. And um, I met my hematologist, who is also one of my buddies at Vanderbilt. Um, bless his heart. He, <laughs> he just started and he got me. So, um, but he and I are, you know, close now. And he's, he's, uh, it's exciting to see him because we have, by the fall and by the next spring, I had, I was, my blood counts were completely normal and I was in complete remission for the, um, for the melanoma. And I have been since about, I think it's October or so of 2012 was my last PET scan, my last, you know, official CT or whatever it was around February um, of 13 when, so it's a remarkable story. Um, my husband and I have, because of that, um, We've, you know, become advocates. I actually, on the, while well, I'm just sitting here, I've gotten a net, I just got a text. I thought it was from one of y'all, but it was really from a friend who is asking for information about melanoma. We are, we are the people that people call and text. Um, and uh, we chaired a Miles for Melanoma 5K here in Memphis for five years, raised a lot of money. Um, and we continue to, I've had the opportunity to go up and, and meet some of the people um, who started that trial and, and the drug company. And um, it's just amazing to me to have things come full circle. I'd actually be sitting here being able to tell the story. That is, it's crazy, but um, my kids are doing great. They're have teenagers now, one driving. Um, we, till we go, I go back, I bring friends to the clinic and we laugh and we, you know, we catch up. Up so, uh, it so you know, all I have to say is thank you, and that's kind of it. Well, Kimberly, we thank you. Uh, this is my second or third time to hear your story, and it is so heartwarming and so exemplary that you were able to stop the drug, but that you have remained melanoma free for all of these years 10 years now, right? 10 years, yeah. I yeah. so. Fantastic. So you really draw that graph out. Right? I do. I try to set the bar high. I like to, I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I like to set the bar high. I'm kind of a, you know, I That's just wonderful how we, I've been. So we respect you and just appreciate everything that you are doing and that you have survived and, and can tell your story. So thank you. Thank you. And if, there are some questions that are going to be coming in the question box. And we will get to those uh, after we have a little discussion from our panel. So at this point in time, thank you, Kimberly, very, very much. Thank you. I would, I would like to uh, introduce our panel of doctors today. Uh, let's see, we'll start off. I'll ask Justin Balco to introduce yourself and then we'll just go around the room. Thank you. Hi, my name is Justin Balco. Um, I was originally a pharmacist that decided that I wanted to go back and, and do science and research. Uh, so I also have a, a PhD now. And uh, I run a, a translational, we call translational research lab um, in uh, UMC and in, in, in the Cancer Center. Um, and so what that means is that we try to incorporate things both from the oncologists that I work around here in the, in the division, um, of hematology and oncology and, and, and try to kind of bridge the gap between what we call basic science, which is what we do, you know, at a very, very high level um, in the laboratory with what's going on clinically uh, in, in patients and, and all that with the, the hope that we learn from the patients and we also learn from um, the basic science that we also do. And so my laboratory is about 10 to 15 people and we focus on uh, cancer and how cancer, uh, uh, multiple different tumor types, primarily melanoma and breast cancer, and how those cancers interact with the body's immune system and how they try to um, uh, thwart it or evade it and how we can uh, overcome that so that patients can benefit more from their therapies. And also a big part of my lab um, is uh, working on personalized medicine, which is trying to understand how we can predict or identify patients that are most likely to get benefit to certain types of therapy versus others so that we can try to prioritize and make sure that 
the patients that receive therapy are getting therapies that they benefit from, and patients that are unlikely to, to benefit from those therapies can um, try other things that maybe they'll get a better response from. Great. Thank you, Justin. Anthony? My name is Anthony Daniels. I'm an ophthalmologist and ocular oncologist. I'm at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center and the Vanderbilt Eye Institute, where I'm the chief of the division of ocular oncology and pathology at, in the Department of Ophthalmology. Um, I treat patients with all different types of tumors. Uh, melanoma is the most common, but all different types of tumors inside and on the surface of the eye in adults and children. And I'm also, I'm a, a physician scientist. My lab focuses also in a translational way on drug discovery for uh, retinoblastoma, a different type of cancer, and uh, melanoma. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Thank you. Doug. Hi, my name is Doug Johnson. I'm one of the medical oncologists at Vanderbilt. I've been here for 10 years, and I'm lucky to work with patients like Tim, and also to help to be involved with drug development of new targeted therapies and immunotherapies, and to try to help use those drugs better in the clinic. And, and Doug is the director of the melanoma program. And also the, what your other institute it has to do with uh, issues with uh, resist, with uh, toxicity with immune therapy, Doug? Yes, I direct the, or help direct the V-Point Institute, the Vanderbilt Precision uh, Program for Optimizing Immunotherapy, which basically means how can we use immunotherapy better and treat the side effects of toxicities better? Thank you. And Caroline. Hi everyone, my name is Caroline Nedhan. I'm a, in my final year of clinical fellowship, meaning I'm just finishing my training in medical oncology. And I have a subspecialization, much like Dr. Don Johnson in uh, melanoma. So I work with Dr. Johnson in the clinic and on clinical research projects in melanoma. And then in the laboratory, I work with Dr. Richmond, um, working on uh, novel strategies to, to, um, to try to improve lives for patients with melanoma. Um, we use various models to, to model uh, melanoma in the clinic, uh, from the clinic in the lab. Um, and I, I think it's a really exciting uh, space to be in both as a doctor and a researcher. Okay, great. Thank you, panel. So now we're going to get into some questions that we think that all of the audience will be interested in. And then uh, after a few of those questions, we're going to address some questions that you're going to ask in your Q&A box. So we'll start out uh, the questions today with uh, what's melanoma and how do you get it? Caroline, do you wanna take start us off with that? Absolutely. So melanoma uh, is a cancer that starts in a specific cell type called a melanocyte. A melanocyte is actually the kind of cell in your skin and in other parts of your body that gives a pigment or color to that, to that area. So anytime there's a genetic mutation in one of those cells that can cause a cancer, that's a, a type of cancer we would classify as a melanoma. Now, while melanoma, mel melanoma most commonly does occur on the skin, in particular in sun exposed parts of our skin, it can really occur in multiple different parts of the body, including on parts of the body that don't get any skin, like the soles of the feet or, um, or in the mouth, mucosal melanoma, as well as in the eye, um, as Dr. Daniels will tell us a little bit more about. Okay, uh, Doug, do you wanna uh, say something more about that before we go to Dr. Daniels? Yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, you know, melanoma it does come from the melanocytes, which is a type of cell in the skin. And that, and that really is, is affected by ultraviolet light when, when UV light comes in, it damages the, the genetics of the cell and causes mutations. And then that also sort of works in conjunction with people's already existing predisposition to cancer. And then in many cases, we get disease and we get melanomas where we don't have a great reason we can pinpoint and say, hey, this was the exact reason. It's a combination of, of bad genetic luck and not necessarily things that were passed down from your family, but just random changes that happen in the skin from sun and other reasons in conjunction with things that, uh, that the environment and, and your own genetics on top of that. Would you mention a few things about the type of genetics you're talking about? You mean like uh, blonde hair, blue eyes? Uh, sure. Yeah. So there's. Red hair. Yeah, that's a great a great point. So there's there's a number of genetic changes that that uh, do predispose to melanoma. So there is the sort of uh, you know the white pigment phenotype. There's less less protection, I guess, from sun damage uh, in in folks with with blonde hair, uh, red hair, light fair skin. Um, there's also several other genetic changes that can be present. That are passed down from family members that, that predispose people a little bit more to melanoma. Now, there's not anything equivalent to like a BRCA gene. So, for example, most of us, for many people, are familiar with 
the BRCA gene, which predisposes people to breast cancers and others, there's not something equivalent to that in melanoma. So there's not necessarily a smoking gun for people that have a family history of melanomas, but there are certain genetic factors that increase the risk to some degree. Although again, we're not talking 10 times the risk, 100 times the risk of the general population. We're talking about things like 10% higher, 50% higher than the normal, uh, than, than the average person. So, so there's no smoking gun genetic changes that, uh, that affect melanoma risk. Uh, what about the number of moles or, or nevi that the patient has? Uh, does that uh, increase the incidence of melanoma? So it, it certainly can. There are certain syndromes, certain mutations in different genes. There's one gene called CDK, CDKNQA uh, that, is, uh, that, that, that may have a mutation. And, that, and, and that's a mutation that perhaps was, was passed down uh, from the family. And that can, that can result in a number of moles. And so the, those folks with a lot of moles probably should see a dermatologist to understand what their risk is and, and how often they should be checked. Uh, again, many of those people will go their entire lives without melanomas, but it would be important for, for those individuals that have you know, numerous moles to, to get in touch with a dermatologist and at least get an opinion. Great and as a patient, one of the best things we can do uh, to, to really be, is be aware of our skin and be aware of what existing moles we do have to kind of watch those. Many of us are familiar with the ABCD rule, and that's kind of a good way to keep an eye on your own skin. So A refers to asymmetry. If you see any moles that have um, kind of irregular borders or that don't look the same on both sides, that's something you might want to see your doctor about, as well as the border, if they're, if they're jagged borders versus a nice, clean, smooth border. C stands for color. So if the color is not uniform throughout, or if there's any kind of variation in it, that's a, a sign to maybe see someone. And the diameter is D. And that's, we usually think about the size of a, the eraser of a pencil or about a quarter of an inch. So any mole that's larger than that is something you might want to see your dermatologist about. And beyond that, like Dr. Johnson said, getting regular skin exams, especially if, if you are someone that has a lot of moles, or if you have any kind of history, personal or family history of melanoma, it's a great idea to be established with a dermatologist and check in with them regularly. Great discussion. Uh, Dr. Daniels, would you like to, to tell us about how do, you, how do you spot ocular melanoma and how does it develop? Yeah, so ocular melanoma is the same as skin melanoma in the sense that it arises from melanocytes, which are the pigmented cells that are also in the back of the eye and the layer under the retina. So if the retina is like the film in the camera of the back of the eye back when cameras had film, the choroid or the UV is a layer underneath that nurtures it and it has melanocytes in it. And as Dr. Nebhan measure, uh, mentioned, any, any tissue that has melanocytes can be a source for, for melanomas. Um, and so these melanocytes can turn into basically moles. Moles are very common, particularly moles in the back of the eye I'm talking, are actually very common, uh, particularly among Caucasian folks. 7% of uh, people who are ethnically Caucasian can have a mole or freckle in the back of the eye. So that in and of itself is not a problem, but rarely one in about 9,000 of them will turn into a melanoma. When it turns into a melanoma, that's sort of where the similarity with skin melanoma ends. You know, the way that it behaves, the way that it spreads, the way that we treat it, and the, the susceptibility of metastases to treatment are all very different for eye melanoma. Um, so, you know, beyond how it forms from a melanocyte, the only thing that eye melanoma and skin melanoma have in common is the word melanoma. Uh, and so, unlike say on the skin, whereas Dr. Nebhan was mentioning, you can look and see if there are changes uh, that you know, maybe warrant going in for a skin examination. Um, you can't really see the back of your own eye, of course. And so these are often found on uh, regular eye examinations. Um, and so you know, people think if they can see just fine, they don't need to get an eye examination, but there are lots of other things that can be going on. Uh, and you know, you really hope that these are found just when they're seen on a clinical examination rather than having gotten so big that they start to actually cause symptoms because the vast majority of these will be asymptomatic until they've gotten quite large. And the, the larger they get, the, the more likely it is that they have already spread elsewhere in the body at the time that they're diagnosed in the eye. Great, thank you. Uh, another question that we want to think about today are, what are some of the things I can do to limit the likelihood of getting melanoma? So um, Caroline or Doug, do you want to start us out there? Sure. I think one that we all know about, uh, the most important, most like, is, is really trying to avoid the sun. 
um, sunscreen, wearing long sleeves, avoiding the sun, particularly during those peak hours. We're all familiar with that in Tennessee when it's hottest between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., really trying to stay out of direct sunlight as much as we can. Um, that obviously helps for cosmetic reasons too. We know it prevents wrinkles and skin damage, but it also gives us the benefit of limiting our melanoma risk by um, preventing those UV damaging uh, rays from getting our hitting our melanocytes and um, inducing any mutations that could cause a melanoma down the road. Um, some studies have shown that that proper sun avoidance and wearing sunscreen regularly can decrease your risk of developing a cutaneous uh, melanoma on that sun exposed area by up to 50%. So it really is quite important that we do everything we can to avoid getting uh, sun exposure and avoid sunburns as much as possible. Yeah, what about Go ahead, right. Dad. I was going to say, I'll echo that about sunburns. It's, it's important, you know, some sun exposure is, is, is a good thing. You want to get vitamin D uh, and so forth, but avoiding those peak sun, peak times of the day, avoiding sunburns. Sunburns are probably particularly important for melanomas rather than just cumulative sun exposure. So avoiding sunburns is crit critically important. And also avoiding high concentrated uh, doses of ultraviolet light, things like tanning beds, those really do increase the risk. And so that's, it's really worthwhile to, to stay away from uh, those kind of things. There's been a number of small studies that have suggested various dietary factors and so forth, but they're very controversial. They've not necessarily been replicated. So they're not great recommendations as far as some of those things that can be done. The biggest things are avoiding intensive, especially sunburn and intensive ultraviolet light and, and keeping a close eye on your skin. That's the biggest thing we can do. And I'll just, oh, and if, go, if I can just con contrast that for ocular melanoma, you know, for melanomas at the back of the eye, there actually, believe it or not, isn't really a, any association with sun exposure. So while wearing sunglasses certainly will help protect you from other eye diseases like macular degeneration, cataracts, and, and also protect the skin around your eyes, um, it probably doesn't play a role in preventing uh, or preventing progression of, of nevi or, or preventing melanomas from forming in the back of the eye. Um, that's sort of uh, unfortunately just a question of bad luck. And so there's nothing you can really do to uh, uh, prevent those from happening if they're going to happen. Uh, so going back to cutaneous melanoma, I've heard uh, reports that it's those blistering sunburns during childhood that later uh, result in the development of melanoma. Uh, would anyone like to comment on that? Is this how we get melanoma lesions in areas where we're not exposing uh, our, that part of our body to the sun at this point in time? I think there is a lot of support for that. And unfortunately, um, how many of us have gotten plenty of sunburns as kids, uh, you know, even if even with diligent parents and diligent sunscreen. So that's certainly important to help help our kids with that, try to avoid those those really intense uh, sunburns. But it does certainly seem that even even relatively small numbers of sunburns can be more important than, than ongoing sun exposure. And not, of course, they're both important, but that is certainly something we can do to help help our kids. Um, and that may be the reason why you know, some people get a, a melanoma on their low back, even though they've had minimal sun exposure in years and years, uh, but it may have been some of those sunburns when, when people got as kids. Okay, great, thank you. Let's, let's shift to talk a little bit about what current treatment for melanoma looks like. Uh, we'll start with cutaneous and then go to ocular. So I'll jump in and talk about kind of what we would do for a localized melanoma or a melanoma that we see on the skin and maybe it hasn't gone to other parts of the body yet. Um, so the, the mainstay of treatment for that is really done with a dermatologist. And that would be um, having a, what we would call a wide local excision or um, even uh, just removing that actual area of cancer plus some of the healthy skin around it to ensure we get good margins. Now, sometimes if a melanoma is deep enough, which is really kind of how we stage melanoma, it may be uh, necessary to do what's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy or to look at the lymph nodes that would be getting uh, or be drained by that particular lesion on that part of the body. So for example, if that's a spot on the arm, maybe it would be that armpit, or if it's in the leg, maybe it would be the lymph nodes, nodes in that groin. Um, and we would look to see if there are any uh, melanoma cells in those specific lymph nodes. And that would play into how that melanoma is staged. So if a melanoma has gone from that initial spot to those local lymph nodes, sometimes as a patient would be referred to a medical oncologist like Dr. Johnson or I, to have what's called adjuvant therapy. And, and Dr. Richmond mentioned that in some of her opening slides. So we have a number of options now for patients. Most commonly we would use immunotherapy like 
those PD-1 inhibitors, pembrolizumab or nivolumab in that setting. And I think of, of adjuvant therapy as, um, as kind of an insurance policy. So it's therapy that's given after a patient has undergone surgery to remove that lesion, their primary lesion, as well as any affected lymph nodes. And then they get about a year of, of treatment with checkpoint inhibitor in most cases. And that will hopefully prevent the risk or, or reduce the risk of that cancer coming back. We know we can't completely eliminate it, but we have clinical evidence to say that we can reduce the risk of that uh, melanoma coming back by giving that adjuvant treatment. And then from there, sometimes, unfortunately, when patients are diagnosed, like Kimberly had mentioned, they'll, all, they'll already have evidence of spread of that melanoma to multiple different places in the body, meaning it's gone from that primary spot to other organs in the body. And that's, that we would treat quite differently. So I'll let Dr. Johnson answer that for us. So there's two, there's two major ways we treat melanoma when it has spread beyond the, the, the localized area. So there's immunotherapy and then there's targeted therapy. So just very quickly. Immunotherapy or treatments that Dr. Richmond mentioned, the anti-PD-1 drugs, the anti-CTLA-4 drugs that stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer. So these are given through the IV, kind of like chemotherapy, but they're very different from chemo. They don't have the same kinds of side effects. They don't work the same way. They basically trigger the immune system to attack the cancer. And the good thing is, as is, 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 uh, Kimberly experienced, is these, these treatments can work when they uh, activate the immune system in the right way, they can really work long-term. They can really be a curative option. And as Ann showed in one of her early slides, now about half of people who are getting immunotherapy are actually surviving long-term, which is an unbelievable advance compared to where we were, you know, really even just five or 10 years ago. The second way we treat melanoma is with targeted therapy. Now about half of melanoma patients have a particular mutation in this gene called BRAF, as Ann mentioned. And so these, these pills that combine a, a BRAF inhibitor with one sort of hits the next link of the chain, which is a molecule called MEK, if you put those drugs together, they work in almost every patient that has a BRAF mutation. And so they, they cause the tumors to shrink essentially all the time. The problem is in most people, they stop working after a while. So on average, they last for somewhere between 10 and 15 months, so a little over a year before the tumors will start growing again and you need another option. Now that's not always true. Actually about one out of five people will actually have a long-term response to the BRAF inhibitors as well. So both the immune therapies and the targeted therapies can cause long-term responses and they can work quickly too. The BRAF inhibitors work more quickly and the immune therapies work longer more often. But they, so they both have their pros and cons, but they're both really effective ways of treating advanced melanoma. Great, thank you, thank you both. Uh, Anthony, would you like to talk about treatment for ocular melanoma? Yeah, sure. So the, um, I mean, the first step in, in treatment is surveillance, right? So catching these early, watching the, the moles in the back of the eye, the nevi. And the reason is, is that like skin melanoma, there's certain features of a mole in the back of the eye that also are indicative that there's a higher risk of it turning into a melanoma in, in the short term. Um, these aren't things like, you know, the ABCDs, they're, they're a different set of criteria that we use to basically uh, a risk stratify how likely is one to turn to melanoma. And the reason this is important is because if you have a, a funny looking mole in the back of the eye or a worrisome mole in the back of the eye, unlike the skin, you don't have the option of saying, well, let's just, you know, let's just cut it out so we don't have to worry about it. Obviously that would be, you know, cause a lot of morbidity to, to the eye. Um, but even, you know, since we don't treat these tumors in the back of the eye with excising, then we actually treat them with radiation. So if um, uh, nevus were to turn into a mole or somebody were to present already with a mole in the back of the eye, I'm sorry, with a melanoma in the back of the eye rather, we uh, very rarely and only for the very largest tumors that are completely filling the eye, would we actually consider removing the tumor where the way to do that means to remove the whole eye. The vast majority, 80, 90% of, of melanomas in the back of the eye, view of melanomas are treated with radiotherapy, different forms. Uh, Dr. Richmond mentioned it in, in her introduction. By far the most common way that we treat these is with a surgically implanted radioactive plaque, what's called brachytherapy. Uh, so basically in the operating room, we would stitch a radioactive device, it looks like a bottle cap, to the eye directly over top of the tumor. And it stays in place for between four to seven days delivers the radiation over the course of the, of the treatment and then trips the operating room a week later and, and you remove the, the plaque after the dose has been given. And this kills uh, the tumor cells and causes the tumor to, to shrink in, in a durable way. Um, the main limitation of that, uh, first that I mentioned that there's still about 10 to 20% that are too big 
to, to treat with a plaque or with other forms of radiation like proton beam or things like that. But the other main limitation is that if the tumor is close to vision critical structures, like the center of the retina or the optic nerve that takes the vision from the eye to the brain, these structures are very sensitive to radiation as well. And so the, the radiation uh, can also result in, in long-term vision loss in the treated eye. And this is really a limitation that we're trying to overcome with, with current uh, uh, treatments. Great, thank you. Dr. Balco, uh, we're, we're aware that sometimes uh, lesions occur in the skin in areas that don't have UV exposure, uh, as well as in ocular melanoma. Does this lead to different types of mutations that then are treated in different ways? Could you comment on that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, the easiest way I think to explain that is um, we know that the sun causing UV damage, we, we, we understand this process, right? So the, the UV exposure um, very readily damages DNA and those damages are those little nicks or, or, or problems in the DNA when those cells copy one another, um, that, that leads to sort of inherited mutations that build up and, and you know, have some possibility of, of turning into um, unrestricted growth and what, what we call a tumor. Um, however, if, if you think about it, we, we know that there's lots of different types of cancer, right? So there's your, the epithelial cells of your, uh, or mucosal cells of, of uh, the, the colon tract, um, the lining of the stomach, um, the uh, brain tissue, right? Lots of places that don't experience sun exposure get cancer. And so that the reason for that is because these mutations can occur for a variety of different reasons. And so just like Dr. Daniels explained that, you know, using a great example of the eyes, not really the back of the eye, not really getting a, you know, hopefully a lot of sun exposure, nobody looking directly at the sun for extended periods of time. Um, you know, that, that the commonality there and actually where it stops with its similarity with the majority of sun exposure caused melanoma is really just that it's derived from a certain type of cell called a melanocyte, which we've talked about many times. Um, and that's really how we characterize cancers or we try to is what that cell of origin, what is that one type of cell that is now, you know, removed all its restrictions and become a tumor. And so Given that explanation, you know, you can think of areas that don't see that, that damaging DNA, damaging UV sun exposures, is they're much more rare, right, for uh, acro on the bottom of the foot or the palms of the hands or ocular melanoma to, to form, but there's still melanocytes there and there's still a possibility that any, tum uh, any type of cell or almost any type of cell in our body can accidentally form some of these mutations through a variety of different factors either carcinogens or exposure to certain things or genetics. Um, and so, you know, I, that's probably the best explanation as to why we can still get melanomas on, on areas that don't see that UV exposure. That's great, Dr. Balco. What about oxygen-free radicals? We hear a lot about those uh, from time to time. Are, are they playing a role in those non-sun exposed areas? Well, they very well could be. Um, you know, these are, are part of our sort of cellular metabolic process, so they can be... Uh, they could be damaging um, and inflammatory in the cells and, and those damages, those, those, those signals that are, are induced whenever um, free radicals form. Um, and you may hear things like antioxidants and things that we try to include a lot in our diet and the possible protective uh, capabilities that they may have for cancer and other diseases. Well, you know, some of these things aren't necessarily confirmed by, you know, really good studies as they kind of scavenge up those they, they, they pull them all in and they help to, to sort of block or block their ability. But those free radicals from a very sort of fine chemical process can also, um, you know, damage DNA and change its shape uh, and, and cause problems whenever that DNA gets replicated during um, the way our cells divide. Right. So chronic inflammation, for example, can be associated with uh, inducing some of the damages in DNA. That's absolutely true. And, a, you know, a great example of that is, um, you know, there was this big study that was reported a couple of years ago and not to take us away from melanoma, but it was essentially, a, you know, a study for um, uh, patients that had um, patients that had uh, uh, cardiac problems like uh, myocardial infarctions. And we knew that the inflammation from that process and through, you know, 
subsequent years could eventually lead to further cardiac damage and things like atherosclerosis. So they were giving this antibody treatment to, in very high risk patients, to uh, keep them from, to see if that would keep them from having further heart attacks. And an interesting thing was that patients that were high smokers, high risk smokers, you know, they smoked a lot of cigarettes, they had a very high, what we call pack your history. Um, when they looked back, you know, you'd also consider those to be patients that would be, you know, at, at, at risk for MI, for myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. They ended up having a lot lower risk of developing lung cancer, so much fewer. So just that idea of, of inhibiting this one inflammatory process um, after a myocardial infarction in patients who were constantly doing inflammatory damage to their lungs, um, it actually blocked the, uh, the the likelihood that they would develop lung cancer. So that's just a really good sort of case in point that that constant inflammation um, in any organ is is a, a, a danger signal for the development of cancer. That's a great point, Dr. Balco. And just to kind of contrast with what Dr. Balco said, I'd also like to point out, we know that patients who are immunosuppressed, and this is most commonly patients who are taking medicines that will suppress their immune system because they've had a solid organ transplant, like a heart transplant or a kidney transplant, and they appropriately need to be on those medicines that will keep their body from attacking their organ transplant. We know that those patients are actually at increased risk for developing skin cancers, including melanoma as well. So that tells us that Yes, we don't want to have too much inflammation, but we also need some function of our immune system to help kind of routine surveillance and, and watching our own skin to try to get rid of any, rid of any early, uh, mel early cancers or early mel melanomas that might develop. So we've really learned so much about the immune system in the last 10 and 20 years, and I know we have a lot more to learn too, um, combining that basic science with what we see in the clinic. Great. I want to transition to the next question that we want to consider, and that is, what are the limitations of current treatment? Um, if we can be brief about this. Um, Caroline, do you want to start with that? I'll let Dr. Doug, do you want to talk? Dr. Doug? So I'll just go quickly. Again, uh, uh, so the, the, probably the two biggest things are, one, trying, uh, trying to understand which patients respond to immunotherapy and why about half of people don't respond. That's a huge issue, not only in melanoma, but across cancer types. And if we get the answer to that, we'll have a, a big, you know, a big inside track into, into curing a lot of different cancers. And the second is what, how we can make the targeted therapy work longer and for more patients. It works really well for the BRAF mutated patients for again, about half of melanoma patients, but then it often stops working. So those are the, if you're talking about the, the big two, those are the big two uh, limitations that we have right now. Er Dr. Richman, I'll answer for ocular. So there are basically three main uh, limitations in treatment for, for uvular melanoma. Uh, the first is that there's still about 10 to 20% of tumors that when they present, they're already too big to treat with standard radiotherapy techniques. And we've overcome this partially over the last five to six years with different types of radiation we developed at Vanderbilt with ways where instead of placing it, basically ways of being able to give external radiation um, and, and save a lot of those eyes that previously were not uh, salvageable. Uh, but still, you know, there are still certain eyes that are too large, uh, certain tumors uh, that are too large uh, to save the eyes. The second is that radiation of all sorts, be it plaque, uh, stereotactic rate of surgery, proton beam, et cetera, all cause damage to visual critical structures. And so uh, it's quite common, unfortunately, for a lot of these patients uh, gradually over the next few years following treatment to have a decrease in vision. Um, there are some treatments that we're working on to try to minimize or reduce or slow down this vision loss. But uh, vision loss is a, is, a, is a sad reality for a lot of these patients in that one eye. Of course, their other eye continues to see fine. So tumors that are too large to treat, side effects of the radiation in terms of vision. And then of course, the third uh, is that a lot of the treatments that we've discussed uh, including targeted inhibitors, including immunotherapy and immune checkpoint inhibitors don't work very well for uh, metastatic uveal melanoma. So while they've revolutionized treatment for metastatic cutaneous melanoma, unfortunately, metastatic uveal melanoma uh, hasn't experienced the same advances in survival that cutaneous has. There is a, a new drug that's gone through clinical trials. It's a, what's called a bispecific antibody. So basically it, it connects a, a target on the surface of the uveal melanoma cells, directly links it to uh, uh, T cells um, called tabanifus that 
uh, will hopefully be coming on the market in the next couple of months that actually has been the first thing to really uh, show increases in survival. So that's hopefully going to change the story and we'll catch up to our cutaneous colleagues in terms of being able to extend life better. Great. So, so this brings us to our next uh, question, which is, how is basic research, ongoing basic research, actually informing our understanding of both cutaneous and ocular melanoma? Um, Dr. Balco. Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, you know, the, the most important thing is, you know, in the end, does whatever we develop or whatever we understand about melanoma, does it work in patients, right? That's the most important thing. But unfortunately, to be able to do that, right, even if you think about you know, how bad melanoma is, but how few patients in the US there are every year, and those patients need to go on a clinical trial or, or, or you know, uh, in order to study or improve on therapy, those patients should be on a clinical trial at some point. And so there's, there's a very limitation, there's a big, big limitation to the number of things you can try. And so we have to understand, it's so important for us to understand what, what causes melanoma to tick, how does it change with therapies, um, you know, how does, you know, what, what kind of therapies will, will make it go away? And, and also why do some of those therapies cause certain types of toxicity? And it, it, if we, if we don't, if we don't understand that, or the best way to understand that is to try to model it in the lab. And I think that this is what you know, many of us do in our, our laboratory component here, both Dr. Richmond and, and Caroline working under her, um, and, and Dr. Daniels in his lab, um, in the way that, you know, for instance, in my lab that, that we, we work with, with them, and as well as uh, Dr. Johnson, where we're trying to find things that we learn in the lab on a very basic level and seeing if, you know, for instance, in patient samples in the patient's blood at the site of a toxicity or in the tumor, do we see those same effects uh, in, in, in the patient samples. So um, it, it's um, really, really important that, that patients are willing to provide uh, tissue from tumors, for example, uh, for study, is that what you're saying? Blood, plasma, it's, tumor it's, lesions. When it when it's feasible, and you know, I, don't, I hate to say convenient, right? But uh, always, um, these are where some of our biggest discoveries, you know, are either made or they're validated from things that we're learning in the lab. So uh, it's right. incredibly helpful. And all this, you know, the biggest part of it is that it can come back. This, those discoveries can come back to new clinical trials that affect other patients in the future. Okay, so uh, I, um, Dr. Richmond, can I just quickly echo one thing that Dr. Yes. Balco said? You know, that's really been the story with ocular melanoma as well, that a lot of things that we found many years ago in the you know, cell lines in the laboratory turned out that they weren't actually the same in actual tumors. And so the shift to actually using uh, uh, tumor tissues that actually come from patients or, or, or cells derived from patient tumors has really allowed us to better understand why some of the things we couldn't understand why they weren't working. And it turned out that the cell lines just weren't really representative of what was actually happening in patients. And so the availability of, of, of tissues and, and it has really allowed us to be more precise in, in how we develop treatments. Okay, great. Now I'd like to spend just a minute talking about where do we see melanoma research and new treatments going in the next five to 10 years? You wanna start that out, Dr. Daniels? Sure. So. Um, I alluded to a little bit before that for ocular melanoma, really the, the, the most exciting thing that's uh, right on, on the horizon is this uh, tabanitifusp, which is basically the, this bispecific antibody that uh, has shown in clinical trials to really extend uh, uh, survival uh, more than other treatments for, for metastatic human melanoma had. So that's, I think, probably the thing in the short term that we're expecting to kind of shake things up a little bit in terms of survival for right. metastatic. Right. Um, and then in terms of, uh, um, kind of other things we're hoping uh, will be closer will be, um, so Dr. Nebhan talked about the concept of adjuvants, adjuvant treatments, so ways to prevent the metastases from forming in patients who are, who are high risk uh, in the first place, and then also better treatments for the, the vision loss. Um, and there's some clinical okay. trials starting for that. Great, thank you. Dr. Nebhan, can you uh, add to that, please? Sure, so in cutaneous melanoma, I think 
melanoma has really been a disease that's pushed cancer therapy forward for, for at least the last 10 years. We were the first disease where immunotherapies were, were approved, checkpoint inhibitors were approved. Um, and so I'm certainly very excited about many things in melanoma, but probably the most excited about seeing some of these new checkpoint inhibitors, new targets come online. Um, we currently have two, that PD-1, PD-L1, as well as CTLA-4, which are ipilimumab and pembrolizumab or nivolumab that are currently approved in melanoma as well as many other cancers now. Um, but we just this year at our big kind of clinical oncology conference called the American Society of Clinical Oncology back in June of this year, saw some really exciting clinical data from a new checkpoint called LAG3 with a new drug called relatlimib that had some really encouraging um, a phase three clinical study or randomized control trial. Um, so I imagine that will be um, coming into the clinics here quite soon once that is FDA approved. There are many others like that on the horizon as well. Great, thank you so much. Now we wanna to turn to some, our panel, our, 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 our audience actually has uh, posed a couple of questions. The first one is what's the status of biomarkers used to guide immunotherapy and melanoma? Would, would uh, Caroline or Doug, would you like to start out with that? I can start with that. So at this point, do we have a number of different things that sort of have general correlations with response? So in other words, people who have a certain marker on their tumor. So I guess to take a step back, biomarkers are, are, are tests that you can run on the tumor or the blood that can help try to predict which people, which patients are going to respond to treatment versus not respond. And so there's a number of things, including one called PDL1 expression. So how much of the, the, the tumor expresses a particular protein, including the number of mutations in the tumor that do enrich for responders. So if people have high PDL1 or high tumor mutation burden, we know that they have a, a trend towards an improved chance of responding. The problem is that it's, it's, it's a relatively weak trend and people who don't have that still have actually very good response rates as well. So it's still lagging in, in, in terms of actually using it to actually guide treatment for patients. So there's a lot of ongoing efforts uh, to try to understand that better. And, and we've got one that we're really interested in called MHC class two, which Justin's really pioneered. If you may want to talk about this for one quick second about how uh, that might be able to use some guide uh, treatment in the future. Justin? Yeah, this is something we're actually really interested in. It's actually really convenient because you know, as I mentioned, we also do breast cancer and we just had a, a big paper come out today that uh, is online today about how this marker that Doug and I have been working on for about five or six years now um, is also seems to be predictive in, in breast cancer patients, which is very con can also a timing convenient because the FDA approved just did two approvals today for both metastatic and early breast cancer for immunotherapy. But you know, as, as mentioned, you know, the biggest deals here are how do we improve the way that we're treating patients, and that comes from identifying the right drug to the right patient. Personalized medicine is something that we've you know, been very interested in for, for many years. And I, I think this is, you know, one way that we could have a really good opportunity to do that and also reduce some of those, you know, possibilities of, of nasty immune-related adverse events, as we call them, or toxicities from, from these uh, immune drugs, or at least reduce that, you know, ma maximize the benefit and minimize the risk. Great. Thank you. And for um, for ocular, the biomarker of most importance is, you know, for Tibentifus, which is this new drug on the, that's coming soon. Um, it only works for patients with a particular what's called MHC class. So they would basically test, it's sort of like a blood type, but it's of the tissue itself. And only patients who have a particular type, which happens to be the most common one, about 53% of people um, have it, only those patients would actually be eligible to get the drug in the first place because it won't work uh, if you don't have that particular target. Um, and then for everybody, the only biomarker that we uh, really that guides us is the genetics of the tumor itself guide us in terms of your risk of metastasis. And so the surveillance regimen would be more, um, you'd be imaged more frequently if you're at higher risk. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another uh, question about evidence uh, that combining immune therapy with targeted therapies uh, improves patient outcomes. Good question. Yeah, that's right. I can take a stab at that one. The, uh, there's was has been a lot of interest from the very beginning. We've got immune therapies, we've got targeted therapies. Let's put them together to see what see if that helps even more. The original studies actually showed a lot of side effects uh, with ipilimumab, which is a more toxic drug. More recent studies have combined the anti PD ones, which are a little less toxic with the BRAF and MEK inhibitors, and there seems to be a little bit of a benefit. The problem is it still does increase the side effects. 
And we still don't know whether it's better than just using sort of the, the best immunotherapy first and the best targeted therapy second. So I think most of us around the country are still doing that approach where we're doing immune therapy, then targeted therapy rather than putting them together. Great. We've had a no number of other questions in the chat box that uh, have been answered individually, but I'd like to point out one that may be of interest uh, to everyone. And, and that is um, this, there's a question about both of my grandchildren's grandmothers have had melanomas. How much has this increased my children's risk of developing melanoma? And at what age should they begin seeing a dermatologist? And Doug, you answered this one online. Would you like to comment a little bit about it? Yeah, so having a family member with melanoma, including a couple of family members, does increase the risk over the general population. Now that's, again, probably something like 20 to 40% increased risk compared to the general population. So you're still probably never, they're probably never going to get melanoma. Still, since the risk is increasing, generally would recommend probably developing regular dermatology follow-up when, when the children become adults. And, you know, you could sort of say 18, you could say, you know, 22, in, anywhere in that range uh, would, be, would be reasonable. Great, thank you. And one other question that was asked uh, was, uh, do we only use uh, immunotherapy for patients with BRAF melanoma, BRAF mutant melanoma? And Doug, you answered that in the chat. Do you want to add to that for everyone to hear? Sure. Yeah, sorry for talking so much. The uh, uh, immunotherapy seems to work equally well for patients with BRAF mutations as well as for patients who don't have BRAF mutations. So immunotherapy we can use really for across the board for patients with advanced melanoma, whereas, of course, the targeted therapies, the BRAF, mutant, the BRAF inhibitors, really can only be used for patients with the BRAF mutations. So for the non-mutant patients, really immunotherapy is the main options. For the patients that have the mutations, then, then really you're, 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 uh, uh, you're talking about both options. Great. Well, uh, this has been a great discussion today. I'd like to really thank our panelists, Dr. Balco, Dr. Nebhan, Dr. Daniels, and Dr. Johnson. Great job. And we want to thank the audience and all the participants for being here today. And uh, if there are any unanswered questions, uh, please reach out and let us know. Thank you for your attention and uh, have a great day.